From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Ahead for you today, K-State's Dan O'Brien will remark on the recent surge in U.S. grain purchases by China and what's behind that. And he'll talk about the drop in the value of the U.S. dollar as a friendly development for U.S. grain exports overall. Also today, K-State's Vipan Kumar will look at the difficulties in controlling Palmer amaranth in grain sorghum, as that weed has really come on with the recent rains. He says that herbicide treatments at this stage of the growing season aren't really feasible. Vipan says instead, think long-term in dealing with this aggressive weed problem. And later, K-State's Mary Knapp on Kansas Agricultural Weather, here on Agriculture Today. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome once more to Agriculture Today. Glad to have you along with us. As we get into the grain market scene, once more with Dan O'Brien, grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension. In a few moments, Dan, we'll pick up on what's happening with China and its fervor for purchasing grain of late. Let's keep it domestic for the moment here to start with and look at crop conditions. And as you've depicted in your notes this week on the trades, the maps show more than a few dry spots right in the Corn Belt. Yeah, you've got this issue happening, particularly in Iowa. So uh, we look at the at the moisture maps and the western two thirds of Iowa, which is, you know, these are the some of the prime corn and soybean production areas in the United States showing dry on the drought monitor maps and uh, projected to be even more so. It's interesting when you look at the corn conditions in Iowa, it shows only a 5% poor to very poor. So it, you're really not seeing the reported crop conditions yet showing it, but yet the moisture maps are. So that I guess that's something to watch. And that brings to mind, well, where do we get the crop conditions? Who's filling it out and what do they see? So dry conditions in the field, you could see where the actual eyeball ratings could could trail that later and there are some other places that aren't doing well actually our our neighbor colorado they're basically 28 percent poor to very poor and that 31 percent just fair so the dry conditions that have existed for a good while are certainly affecting colorado you've got texas also showing poor conditions a drought that they've been seeing down in texas starting to show up you head over into ohio uh, parts of indiana also showing some dryness, but it's just plain that in aggregate, the corn market uh, sees enough moisture around other places that they're not really worried about anything to the degree that that we'd have a, an outcome other than on yesterday's close again, Dees corn at 326. So if, if there is a surprise, it would come there. In fact, if there is discussion that's come on the market, it it's uh, that there may be an early low in in this year and we've seen that in some time frames august september low when uh, the, the u.s market with its focus on crop production prospects almost singularly will uh you know bid down to whatever they've got wherever the market finds support and then respond from there and a lot of times in that response uh, it comes down to either the crop being not quite as good as had been thought or demand responding positively to low prices That sure seems to be the type of a scenario we're looking at as we stand here right now in 2020. And the same can be said on the soybean side. Certainly, yeah. The the November price, new crop price for beans, 888 and a half. And we've had times when you look at the charts where where we've been higher than that. I guess for perspective, we'd gotten down to about 820, about mid-late April. Uh, And of course, a lot of that was influenced by uh, a lot of negativity from COVID-19 affecting all the commodity markets. And then spent a lot of time around 835, 840. And now I've had jumped up, climbed up to about 910. 
fallen off here recently, about to 891. And I think a lot of the positive in that had probably has to do with export business to China and concerns about what, what China will have for a crop. And perhaps as we go forward, we can talk about that even more. Let's go forward as in right into that, if we might. And that's been the head turner these past few days in the markets. Uh, Chinese are buying corn at a feverish pace. And uh, this has to do, in large part, you note, with the price for corn within China, which is soaring. The Dalian uh, market is a inverted bull market. At the same time that ours here in the U.S. is focused on, on production issues. Well, they're an inverted bull market with equivalent prices as we calculate them. Their de corn contract is $8.20 a bushel. And, and the other contracts are heading downward from there. The September corn contract, eight twenty, dollars November, $8.00. January 21, 796, 796 for March, 806 again in May, 810 in July. And so bull market up front, you know, no carry whatsoever. And yet in, in our markets, with our focus domestically, you know, we're looking at carries from September, three, four cents a bushel a month, all the way out to May. So is this something that can't endure? Well, they're focused on floods and the possibility of tremendous damage and destruction if the Three Gorges Dam would have a problem. So they see an immediate problem. They're responding to it, and they, they bid up their corn futures. They bid up their soybean futures also. We'll talk about that in a bit. But our focus is, is on the size of our crop. So what this has done, when we wonder, well, how come China's coming into this market? They're having a moonshot on their market. We're looking at our conditions, and we're low. This is a tremendous buying opportunity for the Chinese. And there's a question, well, how much of a factor should we be paying more attention to that? Well, we'll pay more attention to it when the Chinese buy enough corn to drive futures up to meet with that demand. And so far, we have not. And it's thought-provoking again. So you're looking at September corn futures at 820, 820 per bushel equivalent in on the Chinese futures exchange. And ours right now are, uh, as we've closed, we're we're sitting at about three dollars and fifteen cents, and and looking for some type of support. So whatever it is, it's a, it's a great buying opportunity for China. We shouldn't be surprised as long as this endures, uh, and, and their their problems are continuing. That they'll come in and they'll buy cheap corn from the U.S. until further notice. And as you say, the Chinese have not lost their appetite for U.S. soybeans. We continue to sell briskly into that market. Uh, Again, part of that has to do with their high soybean prices domestically, but it's a matter of their needs for their livestock industry, among other things. Yes, again, soybean meal for hog production and other aspects, other uses. The chart, if you look at the chart of the September contract on the Dalian exchange, look at the November contract, the general contract movement, probably more in sync between the Chinese exchange and the U.S. exchange than, than for corn. For corn, they're just going in different directions. More movement there. But what's, what's shocking on the Chinese exchange is their lead contract is the equivalent of $17.84 a bushel. That's amazing. And, and our, <laughs> ours on uh, yesterday's closes – 891. So you're getting almost, you know, 90, 190% almost double. And again, even more so, their bull market inverted like crazy. Again, 1784 for the September contract, 1656. Well, you drop down to 1650, 1656, 1660, all the rest of the way, but they have jumped up their lead contract a dollar something more than everything else. And we're, we're thinking completely differently here in the U.S., whereas our lead contracts 891, August 891, September 886, 888, November 891, a little bit of carry sideways from there. So, again, similar situations. So, is this indicative of an arbitrage opportunity? Well, who's to say that we're missing the boat on something? But, but you can sure see where their flood conditions and all their concerns are driving Chinese markets strongly higher. And we in the U.S., with our domestic focus on production side, since that's where we're focusing, we are presenting a buying opportunity for the Chinese in corn and in soybeans. And add to that the weakness of the U.S. dollar. So 
these are great days if you want to buy. If you're sitting in a country and you have major problems, you're not sure if you're going to get a crop or if you get one, if you're going to be able to come through floodwater damaged parts of the country, then man, put it on a ship, buy it cheap with the cheap currency from the U.S. and bring it in. This, these are basically great days for them. And really, the value of the dollar falling as it has, it has to lend to overall optimism about our ability to sell grain for an extended time, doesn't it? Yes. And we've been talking a lot about corn and soybeans. Don't want to not mention sorghum and wheat. This value exchange issue is really positive for sorghum. If anything, you're hearing about other countries shifting over sorghum production. I think Argentina had read wanting to get involved in that in that aspect, uh, just because they see this growing well. I, that's just a sign that there's positive signals in, for sorghum, not just in the U.S., but in the world to largely meet that market. And for wheat, hard red winter wheat export pace of 18.6 million bushels for the week ending July 23rd. And that's actually above the pace that the USDA has said that we need in this marketing year. And so maybe the big issue is that uh, when you look at sales and shipments so far for all wheat in the U.S., we're 37 percent of the way to the USDA's projection of 950 million bushels, and only 15 percent of the way through the marketing year. For hard red in particular, we're 34 percent of the way to the USDA's projection, again, only 15 some percent. So the uh, optimism that we've seen in Kansas for wheat prices and and such, at least that we had been seeing till of late, we've been falling off. It's been a positive thing. And again, over the last several weeks, what what do we see the wheat market doing? It's been declining, et cetera. Well, a declining U.S. wheat market, uh, soft U.S. dollar is showing up. When you look at the pace of exports, we're seeing some pretty decent export movement on, on the wheat side in Kansas and for the U.S. overall. Well, we can say at least there are a few cornerstones of potential better times for grain prices ahead as we witness what's going on right now. Dan, have a good weekend. Thanks for joining us once more. Eric, thanks a bunch. Our weekly visit with grain market economist Dan O'Brien of K-State Research and Extension, along with us from his office in Colby, northwest Kansas. Agriculture Today is back after you hear this. This is the K-State Radio Network. With the shortage of primary care physicians, especially in rural areas, health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. This is Agriculture Today. We'll take up one of the more problematic weed problems we see in crop production generally in Kansas. And we'll narrow that down to its challenges in grain sorghum production in particular as we go along here. It's Palmer amaranth, one of the pigweed species. And joining us is a K-State weed scientist out of the Agricultural Research Center at Hayes, Vipin Kumar. A little background and history, Vipin, if you would, about Palmer amaranth and, and how it's become such an overwhelming problem in some cases for producers. That's right, Eric. Thanks for having me. Sure. Uh, I think it's uh, critical to understand uh, how we have get into this problem of Palmer amaranth over the years. Historically, we did not have this problem of Palmer amaranth, we, especially in the western part of the state, if I speak. Uh, historically, we were having uh, issues of kochia. If you see like 15, 20 years back, that was the main problem weed species. But over the time, Palmer amaranth has kind of spread it out uh, across the state. And there are several means by which this weed species has come to our state and kind of spread it out uh, throughout central and western part of the state. The concerning thing with the Palmer amaranth is the uh, evolution of herbicide resistance. Right. It was already uh, documented in other states, like 2005 or six was the first time when glyphosate-resistant Palmer was documented in Georgia. But in Kansas, first reports we had like 2011 or 12. Uh, when we got some biotypes uh, found resistant to glyphosate. 
But in recent years, because it has become more and more of issue and uh, we have seen our Palmer populations has also developed resistance to other mode of actions. Glyphosate resistance uh, is kind of, I, I can say, quite common now in the state, but resistance to other herbicide mode of action is also becoming uh, more concerning, especially the herbicides we commonly use in our cropping systems, things like uh, HPPD inhibitors and PS2 inhibitors and group 2s. So that's that's quite concerning for folks uh, in the state. You bet. And moreover, if we're talking about Palmer amaranth invading grain sorghum, what we're seeing around the state right now is quite a flush of Palmer because of our recent weather conditions. Yes, you're right. We uh, we have been seeing Palmer is getting aggravated in, in grain sorghum and other summer crops. And this is a factor of moisture. Uh, the amount of rainfall we have received in the month of July is kind of above, above normal this year. And that has helped uh, some of the seed bank uh, sitting in the ground to emerge and have a lot of infestation uh, in, in those crops. Particularly for grain sorghum, palmer amaranth is really a concern considering herbicide options. We are very much limited in terms of herbicide options for palmer amaranth uh, control or broadleaf control in grain sorghum in general. And if you really think about some post options, there are not very very many. So that's, that's, a, that's a really a challenge for grain sorghum producers. So the best strategies to kind of take things under control or keep palmer under control is to look at the system level approach. Uh, what are the best management strategies or what are the best management practices we can follow to keep this weed species uh, out of green sorghum? Mm-hmm. I suggest growers to kind of look at you know alternate strategies, uh, try to control this species in rotational crops if they can. There are tools in fallow or you know after wheat harvest which we can use herbicide tools to take care of palmer. But when it gets a problem in grain sorghum, we are very much limited. So try to to avoid palmer in grain sorghum in first place. That's kind of number one strategies I would recommend. Uh, Number two, I think if you're going to go with the grain sorghum, uh, start clean. If you can allow some time for palmer amaranth to emerge before planting, I think that'll be the, the next strategies to follow. If you are thinking to plant your sorghum towards, you know, after May 20th, you can delay a week or 10 days and let the palmer to come first. Because palmer starts emerging uh, right like middle of May, after middle of May. And if you can allow that, you have tools, burn down herbicide programs, which can be used to take care of that palmer flush. And you don't have to deal palmer in sorghum. And also use effective pre-herbicide programs with multiple mode of action. We have options uh, to use as a pre, but we are limited with the post option. So that are the two things. You know, start clean and use effective pre-programs with multiple mode of action. And the third thing could be done is uh, regular scouting after planting. That's where the growers kind of get occupied with other stuff and they forget about scouting sorghum fields. Uh, I think that's the window after three weeks of sorghum planting. They need to go out and see what stage of those green sorghums are and if there is a palmer amaranth coming. That's the time where post option should be should be applied. And so when we think about that latter option, the post applications, we may well be past that point of, of that being a feasible alternative here because of the advance of the crop. Yes. Right? Yes, right now most of our sorghum is either a boot leaf stage or they are heading already. Uh, this is the stage. All the post options are off label right now. We don't have any options at this stage of uh, crop growth. And even Palmer is kind of tall and heading. I, I don't think any herbicide, even those Palmer are susceptible, going to take care of those Palmer. So it really is something of a frustration here for, well, for you and for producers in as far as what to do right now. Uh, they need to be thinking ahead to the next go-round, it sounds, Vipon. It is. It is. That's a really a 
kind of frustrating and kind of, you know, got several calls from growers. Uh, they want to see what can be done, what can be sprayed at this stage, and I really don't have any prescription for them because we are out of, uh, you know, those windows. So, yeah, really uh, like to emphasize if you think proactively and, you know, plan your strategies ahead, uh, you can have a better better success. Again, I would emphasize more and more on best management practices, things like if we can have good programs to start with, if we start clean, let those farmers come and then burn it down. With We have tools before planting. Once those farmers come in crop in grain sorghum, we don't have many options to go with. And then also use some cultural practices. Uh, we have seen in uh, some uh, separate studies that uh, good canopy, either using a little high seeding rate or narrow down the row spacing, can also help with those effective pre-programs to take you to the late season uh, and not having a palmer issue. But several growers, uh, I also saw they have been not using pre-option. Uh, That's the window we really need to wisely use that window to take care of the palmer amaranth and grain sorghum. We would be remiss, though, if we didn't at least mention work that you conducted this past year on those post-applied herbicides for Palmer amaranth. And again, we are past that point of optimum implementation of that strategy, as you say. But but there are a few alternatives that producers can uh, look at when that time comes once again and uh, be somewhat selective about the chemistry that they would use there. Yes, that's right. The results I, I put together in e-update, that was the options we tested considering or mimicking the scenario where growers missed or didn't apply any pre-program and they have only post-option. So these treatments, things like Atrex, Atrazine with the dicamba or Husky, or Husky with the dicamba or Husky with the Atrazine, we really sprayed according to the labels, and that was early, three weeks, four weeks after planting, when grain sorghum was less than 10 inch tall, palmer amaranth was 6 to 8 inch tall, and we had some good success with some of the program, things like husky with atrazine, we got about 95% control. But if you think you're going to spray those treatments now, probably that's not the best deal to go with. So keep that well in mind. If producers would like to reference that information, it's in the Agronomy e-update newsletter posted this past Friday, the 24th of July. So producers, be thinking comprehensively about a combination of cultural as well as chemical control against Palmer. That's your general message, Vipin. Yes, that is. Because, as I mentioned again and again, we are limited with herbicide options, so we need to kind of integrate other tools like uh, cultural practices and using the right rotation and rotational control of this palmer amaranth. Avoid palmer in grain sorghum in somehow, if you can, that will be the best approach to go with. Well, we appreciate you passing this along today for, as you say, many a grower out there, and in particular grain sorghum producers, are finding this to be once again a, a heady challenge as they go through the remainder of their production season. We appreciate your time as always, Vipin. Many thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. That from weed scientist Vipin Kumar, who is based at K-State's Agricultural Research Center at Hayes. Agriculture Today will be back after this break. This is the K-State Radio Network. With the shortage of primary care physicians, especially in rural areas, health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And next up for you, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
Well, both Reuters and Bloomberg are running articles which focus on the pace needed for China to meet its purchase commitments of U.S. agricultural products under the Phase 1 agreement. Reuters reports that data through May put China well behind the pace needed and says that their recent purchase pace of U.S. corn and soybeans would have to be maintained in coming months in order to meet their commitments. Bloomberg reports that China has amassed purchases of U.S. cotton despite a global downturn in textile and clothing demand due to the pandemic. And the Wall Street Journal today reports the rise in Chinese corn prices to five-year highs is expected to result in stepped-up imports of corn and other grains, with U.S. corn producers standing to benefit. Trade data for June, due on August the 5th, will provide a clearer picture of the situation. Noting, though, that the USDA announced in its weekly export sales report that foreign purchasers picked up 3.3 million metric tons of U.S. soybeans this week, ending July the 23rd, that is. That includes 1.9 million metric tons to China. And USDA also announced via its daily export sales reporting system that private exporters sold 1.9 million metric tons of U.S. corn to China for 2021. That would be the largest daily corn sales sale to China on record. In the meantime, the World Trade Organization will appoint an arbitrator to rule on a U.S. request to hit $1.3 billion in China goods with retaliatory duties. This in a dispute over China's subsidies for wheat, corn, and rice producers, according to a WTO official. The U.S. maintains that China has not complied with the 2019 WTO ruling against Chinese agricultural support programs in a case brought late in the Obama administration administration back in 2016. China did not appeal that decision, and the U.S. agreed to give Beijing until the end of June 2020 to comply. China insists that they have complied, but the U.S. says they don't think that that is the case. USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue has expressed concern over relatively new European trade policies. More on that from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue expressed concern about Europe's new farm-to-fork strategy, which calls for more locally grown agriculture. If I were a European farmer based on the farm-to-fork strategies, I would be literally concerned because if you make me anti-competitive, my only hope is protectionism. That's not going to be good for international trade or, or anything. He spoke on a virtual transatlantic panel organized by the European Conservatives and Reformists Party. We have a trade deficit with the EU between the United States and the EU. And certainly that's not even including the $37 billion of automobiles coming from the European Union. So there's a lot of risk. What's his solution? Let the consumer ultimately decide. That's what we do here in the United States. Let your consumers decide if they want these products, then they will buy them. If they don't, I can assure you our farmers won't send them. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And a public hearing will be conducted on Friday, August the 14th in the morning in Leote to consider a local enhanced management area water management plan in a designated area of Wichita County in west central Kansas. This virtual hybrid hearing will provide an opportunity for in-person oral statements as well as virtual participation online. More details on that hearing, including a link to the live hearing and more, can be found at agriculture.ks dot gov agriculture dot ks dot gov Well, the stars are aligning for a big outbreak of volunteer wheat in the coming weeks around Kansas. That volunteer serving as the green bridge for a costly disease, as you know. Marsha Boswell talks more about the need for volunteer wheat control on this week's Kansas Wheat Scoop. Marsha? There is increased risk of wheat streak mosaic virus in next year's wheat crop due to a number of factors. There is no treatment for wheat streak, so the best way to stop the spread is by controlling volunteer wheat and grassy weeds. Losses from wheat streak were down in 2018 and 19 from a high in 2017, when they reached $76.8 million in loss to Kansas wheat farmers. Several factors lead to 2021 being another year of potentially devastating losses. First of all, agronomic conditions during the 2020 wheat crop have a large effect on the amount of volunteer wheat that is emerging. 
drought conditions last fall and this spring decreased kernel weight and likely increased harvest losses of grain. These smaller kernels might germinate into volunteer wheat, increasing the risk of severe wheat streak mosaic next year. Farmers also faced several other production challenges in 2020. These included freeze damage, hailed out wheat, some reports of head scab, and water logging conditions in parts of central Kansas. These can all increase the presence of volunteer wheat. Secondly, some areas of the state have seen substantial rainfall over the past couple weeks. For example, areas in southwest Kansas have received three to four inches more precipitation than normal this July. While this moisture is certainly very welcomed in drought-stressed areas, wet weather through late summer often favors multiple flushes of volunteer wheat and also favors the growth of other grassy weeds that can also support moderate populations of the curl mites and virus. These weather patterns keep a lot more alternative host plants alive during the critical period when mites and the virus would not have plants to survive on. Thirdly, the farm economy is in a decline right now, so farmers may not want to invest the money in controlling volunteer. Farmers are enduring a multi-year slump in crop and livestock prices that is pushing many to the edge. With the COVID-19 crisis and loss of export markets, farmers are facing a plethora of challenges. The decline in global growth has impacted farmers and ranchers in three distinct ways. First, decreased global trade, specifically phase one of the U.S.-China trade deal. Redirection of food supply, while businesses were closed, farmers lost markets to restaurants and schools. And bottlenecks in food supply chains, such as lack of agricultural workers available. Despite these factors, farmers must control volunteer wheat now to stop the streak. The farm economy can't afford to leave another $76.8 million in the field again next year. A second management practice to limit the spread of the virus is to avoid early planting. Finally, farmers can choose varieties with genetic resistance to wheat streak mosaic virus or the wheat curl mite. By following these management practices, we can stop the spread of wheat streak mosaic virus in next year's wheat crop. For Kansas Wheat, I'm Marsha Boswell. Many thanks, Marsha. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we'll be back after this final break over the K-State Radio Network. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. Coming your way now on Agriculture Today, K-State Research and Extension Climatologist Mary Knapp and the latest from the Weather Data Library on Kansas Agricultural Weather. And we've behind us now, Mary, another week of healthy rains, but... How widespread around the state, as the numbers tell us? Well, as we look at our um, weekly totals, and that's going up through Tuesday, uh, which feeds into the U.S. Drought Monitor, every single division in the state averaged above normal for the week. Um, The driest area was actually in the central division, and they were 102% of their normal. For the driest. (laughs) That was the driest. So not surprisingly, we saw some improvement in the drought monitor. But also note that that cutoff date is Tuesday, and the rains did not stop then, which is why we've got some locations that had an overabundance of rainfall with the attendant problems that come with that. There were flooding issues, flash flooding issues, most notably in Topeka, where they captured quite a few cars floating in the in the water. But there were also flood advisories in Clay County and various other areas around the the central part and particularly the northeast part of the state where we had some very heavy rains after that cutoff date. <laughs> Now, today is the final day of July, and the official numbers aren't in yet, but you've preliminary figures on rainfall for July. What are those suggesting? Well, those are suggesting, again, that northeast corner, Donovan, Brown, Atchison County was the heaviest area where we're looking at over 14 inches of rain for the totals. 
but we can see some high numbers in other parts of the state. Ellsworth County had a number of locations with over 10 inches of rain. And even out in the Dodge City area, we had stations that had over five inches of rain. Not as dramatic as in Donovan County, but they don't typically see as much in that southwest corner. That's a good So, month. again, some very healthy rains even in our southwest corner of the state, which is where it's really been on the dry side. Not so much as far as rainfall in the southeast. We're still watching that area for deterioration in the drought conditions. They did see some rains out of this system, but again, that's an area of the state that typically would see a lot more rain than they had. And when we translate all of those into the latest drought conditions, we saw a big reduction in the area of drought. We managed to eliminate the extreme drought in western Kansas. We still have a fair area of moderate to severe drought, but again, carved away a lot of that with this last week of rain. In the southeast, Not so much change in that. We carved away a little bit on the northern edge of that. Again, through the East Central Division, they saw some very nice rain. South Central saw some nice rains. And so that allowed for some improvement in those areas. And accompanying the rainfall these past several days, cooler temperatures, and particularly for corn, that's welcome. Right. It's interesting to note, though, that when you look at those cooler temperatures, most of it was from the high side of the coin. We were still seeing nighttime lows that were warmer than they would typically be, but still more in the acceptable range for the corn. Some places still were seeing lows in the 71, 70 degree range, which is kind of on the upper edge of what corn likes, but um, there was more widespread lows in the 60s, which again is more beneficial for that. The temperatures have not gotten so cool that it would slow down the accumulation of the growing degree units, so that has been welcome. We still have a lot of development that's needed, not so much for the corn. The corn is doing very nicely, but for the soybeans and the sorghum crop, as well as cotton, we'd like to keep a little bit more heat going for at least a few more weeks. Well, then, today the rains are moving onward. But as we look at the immediate outlook, we've cooler temperatures and rains off and on throughout the next several days. Right. We're looking at fairly dry weather for the weekend across most of the state. But the highs are expected to be more in the 80-degree range with lows in the 60s, which will be cooler than normal. will be a welcome break from the summer heat that we've had and the muggy conditions that we've had, particularly in the eastern part of the state. But there's another round of unsettled weather for midweek around um, Wednesday. So the question will be how widespread with as much soil moisture as we've got currently to be evaporating and feeding that air profile, the chances for pop-up thunderstorms will be fairly good, but they can bubble up in an area and not move very much, giving impressive rainfall totals where they're at, but just over the line, you won't see as much from it. So again, that's why the probabilities are fairly low. When we look at the quantitative precip forecast for it, one encouraging note is they're calling for a fairly good chance of getting as much as two inches of rain in that southeast corner of the state. So we could see further removal of drought across the state. should note that we're over 50% drought-free right now, which is a pretty good improvement from where we started at the beginning of July. And tomorrow ushers in the month of August, so remind us of the forecast for the month. Okay, they have not updated it from the middle of July yet, but the current outlook for August is a slight chance for warmer than normal conditions and 
drier than normal conditions confined pretty much to the southern tier of the state. But at least the month of July provided us moisture to get us in a decent shape heading into that potential dryness. Right, and it's certainly been very welcome for the pastures and rangelands, and it starts putting a little bit in the profile for those fall seeded crops. Very well, Mary, thanks for coming over. We'll talk again next Friday. Thanks, Eric. Her weekly update on Kansas agricultural weather, research and extension climatologist at K-State, Mary Knapp there. Thanks to you as well for joining us, and please be back with us here on Monday, won't you? Until then, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good weekend for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.